Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Stanley number CEFBB191-54, four and a half, four and a half, US 32D, stainless steel, four wire hinge uh, is what this is. Let's take a closer look at the actual hinge, and here it is. Um, one thing always impressive about Stanley is their fit and finish is always exceptional. The hinges are, you know, any any mark or defect on this hinge is as a result of me handling it, taking it out of the packaging, really clean. Um, you know, that's not the case for every hinge manufacturer, and it matters. The hinge is just a hinge. Nobody ever notices it, but, you know, it's more of a telltale sign over the command that the manufacturer has over the manufacturing process. When the material arrives to you, and there are certain things that I look for when, in a hinge that tells me a lot about the manufacturer themselves and how well they go about the job. The actual accuracy of the thickness of the leaf is number one. The uh, level nature of the hinge leaf as well. How well they get into the crotch of the hinge here and do the finishing. And I think Stanley has done a very good uh, job on this hinge, even though it's, you know, a solid brass base material with just a brushed finish. It looks like a good job has been done. Let's check the next criteria here. Take a look at that hinge leaf there. Appears to be nice and flat. Uh, for the most part, let's see. Yeah, pretty nice and flat, I would say. Also a telltale sign, how thick is the leaf? This ought to be 134 thousandths. My caliper, and I, I'm feeling it's thin. I'm wrong. It's 0 .13, 135. So that's really accurate uh, for a manufacturer. I thought for a moment it seemed a little thin. It's actually a, a, a thousandth of an inch too heavy, which is perfect uh, in terms of this. So great fit and finish. That's a hallmark of Stanley. Their hinges always work really nice right out of the box. They, they, they operate smoothly. These people really have it figured out, that's for sure. So what is this hinge? It is a a power transfer hinge, an energy transfer hinge. It is a electrified hinge. There's nothing electrical about it except that you can pass low voltage current through it as a result of these two pair of wires here, which go through the hinge, through the knuckle, here, out here. Okay, And what you would need this or use this for simply is to get power from the back of the frame through the hinge, through the door to something. Um, you know, an electric, a lock set that will have uh, control over the outside trim to uh, allow you to um, rotate the trim or not. Uh, maybe it's an electric strike in a pair of doors. Maybe it is an exit device with a uh, electrified dogging whatever the case is that you need to get power into the door. It could also be, uh, I've done it twice actually in the last couple of months, it could be that you have that type of glass and I could easily look up the terminology for it, but there's glass that when you apply current to it, it goes from opaque to transparent, transparent to opaque. Two jobs in the last couple of months where people needed the hinges for that type of glass. Um, so it could be something you know like that as well, not always hardware. And uh, this is otherwise a typical uh, FBB191, which means in Stanley speak, it is a full mortise hinge. You can see from the swag on the hinge leaves here in here that when the leaves are brought parallel, they're meant to be mortised flush to the edge of the door and frame. Okay, that's a full mortise hinge, the swag, the bend here and here. And if you study different hinges, what defines how they're different from each other is absolutely the bend on the hinge leaf. Okay. Um, it also means that it's a five knuckle hinge. It means it's a ball bearing hinge. It means it's standard weight, meaning it's 134 thousandths when it is four and a half inch tall. Um, template pattern, these screw holes are in the typical location that you're gonna find for all doors, frames, hinges that are made to the template pattern, which is a specific location for all four screw holes um, to the center line. And again, you're going to use this when you have to get power into the door. Um, they're more elegant to use than a, a, a surface-mounted door loop, which is just quarter or three-eighths flexible conduit. 
that's been surface mounted, even those are those are very inexpensive ways to transfer power. They're certainly the least elegant. They're exposed. They're subject to, you know, vandalism, um, you know, unintentional damage to occur. The wiring in here is utterly concealed. You don't see anything when this is installed. Okay, you don't, you will see no evidence that there's power coming through this. You can't remove the pin from this. These are not load bearing, no such wire transfer hinges. Not, I think there are some intermediate pivots that are load bearing that are power transfer, but as far as I know, hinges are not. There could be, I was reading something earlier this week. There may be a manufacturer who has a load bearing power transfer hinge. It is going to have the UL listing on it. Um, this, Uh, I believe is a UL certification that it meets what might be UL 294. Um, don't quote me on that. I think that UL, you can use this on a fire rated door, but this also is going to refer to, I think, the fact that it is that it meets the criteria for something that has power running through it. Okay. There you go. Now, it's a four and a half inch by four and a half inch hinge is what this is. It's important to know that the height is four and a half inch. The first dimension is four and a half inch. The second dimension is the width. It's four and a half inch. Why is that important to know? Well, you can get away, as I did for a couple of years, ignorant as to which dimension is first. Um, sooner or later, you'll find out, as I did, that the height is the first dimension. I had a client order some a uh, couple of doors, actually no, about 20 doors, for a uh, university inside of the city of Chicago itself that has a large campus downstate, uh, its primary campus. Um, one of their administrative buildings, several stories tall, 20 story tall building, um, stairwell doors. And there were a couple of them that were three foot six and the client ordered, the specification for those were five by four and a half. Great, so I supplied him with hinges that were five by four and a half in my head thinking it's the same way that the doors are. The doors, width is the first, the height is the second. Turns out that's not how hinges are done. Uh, they're done opposite. So I sent him four and a half inch tall hinges that were five inch wide. And he says, uh, these hinges were supposed to be five by four and a half. I'm like, yeah, they are. It's like, uh, no. I'm like, what do you mean? They're four and a half inch tall. I then learned why that's important. Um, I think the difference between a door and a hinge or what dimension is given first is because what's the most important thing to know? Or what, what is, you know, if, if I were to tell you to drive from, you know, point A to point B, um, do you want to know the speed at which to drive first or the direction? You know what I mean? One you want first. You want them both, but one you want first. Head east and proceed at, you know what I mean? So a door, what's more, the, I need to know the height, but the width would be the thing that I would say, tell me that first. Likewise with the hinge, tell me the height first because it tells me a lot about the job that it's going to do. Uh, the potential thickness of the door, the potential size, uh, rating, uh, volume of use on the door, uh, things like that. So if you're telling me that it's a four inch hinge, okay, um, it could be inch and three quarter, uh, it could be residential, it could be commercial. Um, it's definitely not heavy duty, you know, so you can infer a lot of things by knowing that first. Um, and it's because you're going to deal with rectangular hinges. A very common size is four and a half by four. Okay, four and a half by six. I ordered today for a client five by 12. Okay, five inch tall, 12 inch wide hinges. Um, you know, four by three and a half. These are, these are common hinges. It's important to know the height is first. Um, luckily on that job, the client said, okay, okay. Now, why did he need five by four and a half? Because I had said they were three, three foot six. You get wider than 3.0 and you've got a, a door with moderate volume, heavier gauge, you're going to a taller hinge because that taller hinge, you know, that four and a half to five, that increases its capacity to handle the load by about 20% from what I understand. So, you know, the client had the doors... Um, what did he have? He had the doors prepped at four and a half inch and I sent him, I had just ordered five by four and a half thinking I was going to get four and a half by five. So he had doors and frames that were prepped four and a half. Of course, masonry walls, that's, they're not coming out. Uh, doors on site. 
and he had hinges that were four and a half by five. No, no, he had five by four and a half inches because I just ordered them that way. So the hinges were too tall. And he says, well, okay, send me four and a half inch, you know, hinges. And the client was able to make that work. And they were rated at standard weight, five by four and a half. The doors and frames were convertible to heavyweight. So we went with a four and a half heavyweight hinge to offset the loss of efficiency in terms of going from a five by four and a half inch. All was well at the end of the day. I dodged that bullet without any financial pain or long-term damage to the relationship, thankfully. Suffice it to say, in the last 28 years, I haven't made that mistake again. So you don't like to do that twice. What else is to talk about? Uh, the height we've got now, US 32D, that's the old way of saying 630 finish. That means two things. It's It means three things, actually. It's made of solid stainless steel, one. Two, it's in a brushed finish. Number three, that means that it is the most durable finish available. It's called a natural finish. A natural finish, uh, in this case, US 32D or 630, is the most durable of all finishes. So if a client says, I want the most durable finish, exterior application, I need it to really last. And where you're certainly going to hear that sort of comment from a client is when they are in a coastal application where they say, you know, the ocean is a half a mile away. I, I have to have the most durable finish. Great. It's it, the, here. This is it. US 32D. There is no finish. There is no uh, base material and finish combination that's more durable than this. Okay. Um, obviously available in a polished stainless. If you change the 191 part number to a 179, that infers um, a steel-based material onto which they can do any finish that you want that can be done in steel. Um, if you were to change, well, it, actually, uh, if you leave it at a 191, you could also do stainless-based material and brass or bronze-based material as well that you can do you know, natural finishes like a polished brass, you know, things of that nature. So this hinge is capable of being done in different base materials and finishes. So let's uh, probably before we switch to the screen view, this is a four wire hinge. Why would you want a four wire hinge? Well, because you are powering something that takes two, that requires two wires. Now, there's four on this. You always plan for one pair extra, always. You will never see a two wire power transfer hinge. They don't exist. Um, so when you are running, you know, just an electric strike that's got, you know, black and red, positive and negative, you know, it's going to be a four wire hinge. If you have a, I just two days ago, a client ordered an electric strike that has, this client needed a 10 wire hinge. Here's why. He's got black and red for positive and negative. He's got latch bolt monitoring. He has, he, there are two monitoring capabilities. The presence of the latch bolt alone requires a common normally open, normally closed. Then it had the keeper position as well. Common, normally open, normally closed. That's eight wires. Now would he need, so on paper you'd do a 10 wire hinge. Does he need all of those? Possibly not uh, because he might not do half of the, he might not do the keeper position uh, audit, you know, reporting back to access control. So you don't need those three wires. He might not need to be able to have that switch where it's common, normally open, normally closed. He might not be wiring one of those where it's either, you know, open until it's closed. You know, so it may not be a requirement of having all of those. But on paper, it'd be a 10 wire hinge that you would require. Uh, so the bottom line is determine the potential quantity of wires that you need. Add another pair. You don't want to add four more or, f you know, ten more because then the project gets costly. So the rule of thumb is add an extra pair over what you're going to end up needing. With this client ordering that strike, to have both monitoring capabilities, to not wire, because he had called and said, hey, how many conductors do I need to run to this door? Wow, he says, I, I, I can't run 10. I don't need 10 wires. I'm like, well, I understand. This is why you'll, this is what's telling me that you need the wires. Proceed as best suits your requirements. Um, but that's why you'd end up having that. This is a um, two pair of 28 gauge wire. You'll also need to make sure that what you're powering through the hinge will be satisfied by that gauge. Older 
not they're older, but solenoid-driven exit devices that have 16 amps of inrush, you're going to need to have a pair of more durable wires. And you'll very often find hinges like this with a pair of 18 gauge and then a whole smattering of much thinner because if you're just running a request to exit switch or a rex switch where you have a lever on the inside every time you rotate that lever it hits the micro switch that reports back to um, access control you need you know 28 gauge wires is gonna, will be perfect for that because there's you know it's just making contact anyway let's switch to the screen view now and let's take a closer look at all of the supporting documentation if you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Okay, here's the item that we are indeed looking at. Let's take a look at some photographs as well, just to get a little bit more forensic view, I suppose, of what this looks like. The label. The hinge, the screw pack, the installation instructions, which we'll look at in a moment. One thing that I like about Stanley hinges is that their logo is relatively petite. They don't, you know, put it the size of a silver dollar on their hardware. Corporate advertising is okay, just keep it moderate. That's illustrating what, a, what the full mortise style hinge looks like. Um, okay, you can see the swag here. Backside, showing the wires. Have some sort of a durable epoxy that holds them in. Here are your wires, coated, color-coded, I should say. Really small drill bit all the way through there. That's what that is. That's what that's showing. Okay. Your screw pack, all machine screws, all wood screws are included. Well, they are included because they were specified to be included on this project. I didn't know what the client's composition of the door and frame were. So that's the, you know, I just said AWS, AMS when ordering them. So we have a template that's here. And this template is important because it will show you the location of the template lo pattern for the standard screws, but it will also show you where to drill the door and the door hinge plate and the frame plate for the power transfer to come through. So you'll have to drill a couple of holes. Okay. The dash 54 in the part number does tell us it's a four wire hinge, and then the composition of what those four wires are. They're all 28 gauge. Um, I had said 18 gauge earlier. I might be thinking of another manufacturer. Their dash 66 is a six wire where, where you'll get a pair of 24 gauge wires and then four 28 gauge. Okay, so four and a half by four, four and a half, four and a half. The different part numbers of the hinge, um, concealed bearing, standard um, exposed bearing packets, standard weight, heavyweight. This is an institutional hinge, a, um, a um, hinge, to, uh, a hospital tip sort of preparation. Steel base, non-ferrous base, thickness gauge of the material. I don't see anything else here that's important. Uh, except to note, deburr both faces of the hole and prime to help avoiding damaging uh, the insulation over the wires. When you drill these holes, rat tail file them clean, hit them with primer, uh, make sure that they are, you know, free of metal shards and debris, um, and you don't want to snag these tiny little wires. They're quite easy to break. There's also a link to the installation template. We'll skip over that. It's really not germane. Neither is this link called Hinge Size. These are those two documents are from their sister company, National. Let's go on to the uh, documents that are uh, germane. 
which would be the installation instructions that are included. It's going to be an extension of what we've just discussed. It's important to know the max rating is for 50 volts, 1 amp, um, for um, a continuous. And if you're going to have an inrush at 15 amps for a half of a second, okay, max inrush not to exceed a half of a second or 50 milliseconds. So 50 volts AC or DC, standard continuous can be up to 1 amp, and rush can handle um, a 15 amp. Okay, So your 5.4 will handle that, except you could have an exit device that requires 16 amps, and then you're going to need a different uh, configuration on that. Okay. Now, as we continue to look through here, you'll see the different part numbers, 54, 56, 58, and 10, or the extensions. They will tell you your maximum amp continuous per wire. So what people will do is they'll literally double up their wires so that you can run a little more amperage through the wire because you're doubling the quantity of wires. You're going to take one pair of them and tie them off and treat them as one wire. The dash 66, its electrical characteristics are here. Okay. You've got 4 at 28 gauge, if you recall, and 2 at 24 gauge, so 2 amp. That dash 1.8 is where you're going to have a heavier application. Um, they do make a, an 18 gauge uh, version, the dash 18, that will allow 10 amps to pass through it continuously. Max inrush for the dash 18 not to exceed 20 amps for 4 seconds. So if you're going to do something with tremendous inrush, or large amperage requirement, you know, the dash 1.8 would be your hinge. Mechanical installation, debris, you know, prepare the door and frame, drill the holes, deburr the holes, hang the door, attach the wires. You know, the hinge is quite durable. You're not going to break the wires unintentionally, but you won't want to roughhouse with, the, with them. They're, they are 28 gauge wire, so they are pretty small, pretty thin. And I'll let you read the rest of that. It's pretty typical. You know, carefully tuck the wires back in after you terminate them. Then there's a link to the um, cut sheet, is what I would call it. And this will give you an overview of the CE hinge. The CE concealed electric hinges conduct current regardless of door position to electric locks. Exit devices are hold open devices where, tamper -proof where a tamper proof application is required. Also to transmit signals from co co uh, code or card readers on doors to remote uh, computers for access control. No electrical parts are, are exposed when the hinge is installed. Permanent fast pin. You, like I said, you can't drive the pin out. Hinges like this should be installed in the center location because it's that top hinge that does almost all the work when it comes to just simply carrying the load of the door itself in terms of the weight. So you won't want, you'll never use an electric hinge up at the top. That will be your, you know, um, your, your standard hinge. You can do concealed wire and concealed switches as well, where both are desired on the same hinge. You can do a CECS, and a concealed uh, switch is nice because it's a door position switch. It will tell you when the door is cycled open and closed. You might want to report that to access control. You might want to have a, uh, a, a monitor light somewhere. You might want to have a local enunciator. You know, when you open that door and the contact switch has changed state, you could fire an alarm. So that can be concealed in here as well. Packed one per box with all machine screws and installation instructions. As I had said earlier, I did tell them all wood screws as well, and they did include all machine and all wood screws. The point of that is be clear, define what you want so that there's no um, arrival of the product and it's not sufficient for your requirements. We just have to specify it to the factory. What all these factories do great is interpreting proper part numbers when they're complete and, and, and giving them all the information they need. When ordering, specify class number, size, finish, number of wires, and then your suffix. Class size would class number would be F, you know, BB191. Okay, there's your that's the class of hinge that you're doing. Four and a half, four and a half, six thirty, four wire, dash fifty-four, or whatever you're doing as we discussed, should be used along with a junction box. Yeah, what they're saying there is, well, 
I'm not sure what they're saying. They might be saying that behind your, what they might be saying is behind your frame, you should have a junction box behind there so that dirt and debris don't, you know, affect those wires or those connections. They also could mean that a junction box would be if you have a elevation drawing of your door and you've got your electric hinge and you're showing those wires go up, you'll have your power supply 120, okay, and you're powering a lot or a request to exit switch, let's say, that could be going to a junction box where they want all the terminations to be done in here. Um, you know, so you're just running the wires and terminating them up in the junction box. Maybe that's what they mean as well. Can be first furnished with hospital tips. What that means simply is the barrel of that hinge kind of looks like this, right? Well, a hospital tip is where they take and grind all that down so that you can't loop something over the top of the hinge barrel. It makes it ligature resistant tables in terms of the electrical characteristics that we talked about. And here's the tip off on the junction box. There you go. Covering that is what the bottom line is. You're going to install that into a, into a masonry opening where the mason is going to trowel grout like mad into that frame and pack it thoroughly solid. Yeah, you're going to want to deflect all that from hitting your 20, your 28 gauge wires. Um, you know, and bring conduit to it, obviously. You know, you're going to run conduit down to the junction box and it'll be terminated inside of there very well. So a really handy document. If you were to study it, you'll find all the information you need. And really what it boils down to is, as they said earlier, what is your class number? What hinge are you using? Is it a BB, is it an FBB 168, a 199? Is it something else? Um, what size, what finish, and how many wires? And the suffix that you're going to use in terms of wires, you're going to take from right here or right here, depending on what you need to do here and here. It's that simple. And Stanley does a great job with these. Now, there's a link below this video here to the manufacturer's page where you can pull up not only all of the Stanley products that we sell, but also a link to the manufacturer's website, as well as a link to the full product catalog. And the one that I like is the one from 2010, because this document is, well, it's the one that I'm accustomed to, and I know where all the tabs are, so to speak, but it's encyclopedic, and it's... Um, approach, the first several pages, is indeed an, encycl an encyclopedic approach to all things hinge related. And if you work within the industry, whether you're a distributor or an integrator or an architect, having a working knowledge of terminology when it comes to hinges, um, you know, would be necessary to go through that. And the Stanley document, the Stanley hinge is really great for that. There's not much I can think of that's not in here. And while there's a, a there's a hinge that there's one I'm thinking of right now that is not defined here. Stanley apparently doesn't have it. This is all but thoroughly um, conclusive in its totality of having every type of information you can have. Raised barrel hinges, wide throw hinges, swing clear hinges, power transfer hinges, on and on. Anchor hinges, pivots, on and on and on. Okay. Reinforcing pivot here. They call it a shock arrestor. I've never heard it called that, but... And, uh, you know, an anchor hinge uh, would be wrong as well. Uh, this would be called a reinforcing pivot. You use that when that top hinge plate is blown out and you want to retain the uh, hinges on the door. You can use this at the top. That's called a slip-in hinge. That is a non... Well, it, it, it can be... It, it's a funny swagged hinge that is meant to slide into a slot in the door and or door and frame. They call it a slip-in hinge. Swing clear, uh, this would be half mortise swing clear, half surface swing clear, full, oh, I'm sorry, half surface swing clear, full surface swing clear, I said that wrong. Uh, olive knuckle hinge, palmel hinge, these are really cool. You don't sell those often, but when you do, they're, it's really awesome. That's the hardest thing that I've ever machined for with a router onto a wood door. It took me an hour before I was, I built the confidence to start machining the door. There's your hospital tip. Decorative tips are here. Just a great approach to, to the understanding of hinges, and I would encourage anyone to read that document or at least know where to find it. Let's wrap up this video on camera.
In conclusion, very nice quality product from Stanley. We've talked about what it is, where you're going to use it, um, why you're going to use it. Access control is like the Python. They don't move very fast, but they move surely. They are slow, but they get you in the end, and access control is everywhere. Um, if you've spent any time in one of the oldest cities in the United States, New York, specifically Manhattan, um, literally, George Washington was running around Manhattan, okay? Um, you know, so that's how far back Manhattan goes. Um, access control is everywhere. And if it's everywhere in the old, one of the oldest cities in the United States, you can bet that it's coming to a place, a location near you in the near future. To have an understanding of a low voltage and access control um, is really necessary in this day and age when it comes to being able to fulfill clients' requirements. I'm currently going through a DHI class, EHC 300 is what it's called. So far it's really talking about creating the documentation so that you can very clearly uh, share with the other interested parties, integrators, owners, architects, um, you know, your staff, distributors, manufacturers, what's happening in the electrified opening. Um, you know, the mechanical key is not going any, anywhere anytime soon. It is not going anywhere anytime soon. But access control continues to get less costly, um, more understood, uh, more ubiquitous, uh, more convenient. Um, you know, with the advent of, you know, apps on cell phones, you know, if you don't have a product that I can control by an app, it's like, you know, you're out. You're out of the business. Um, so be mindful, access control has been, in my 30 years, it's gone from just a push button and an electric strike and a transformer to stuff that's far more uh, detailed, require, uh, with, more, more, uh, with, with a larger sphere of requirements from the owner. I want this to happen during this time, the opposite thing to happen then, and when that happens, I want this to happen, I want this to happen. Um, and that's just garden variety kind of stuff. So anyway, um, you know, my opinion is, you know, get along with access control or render yourself, you know, less pertinent to the ongoing conversation. Stanley does a great job with their documentation. Any questions on the CE FBB 191? Four and a half, four and a half, six thirty, and a dash fifty four, or any other Stanley product. Please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you. Again, thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe, and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.